number field with R is M2 of R, well, isomorphic to M2 of R. And A is not isomorphic to M2 of K. All right. Uh, then there is not isomorphic to M2 of K. Sorry? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> not isomorphic to M2 of K, yes. Then there exists a, uh, right, a co-compact, well, discrete, uh, all groups here will be discrete, co-compact Fuchsian group. subgroup of PSL2R uh, with invariant uh, trace field and quaternion algebra So there's some people here who know much more I think, number theory than I do. And there and on the other hand, this is a conference in three manifolds, where I don't think I can assume that everyone in the audience knows what a quaternion algebra is um, or the trace field of a group, because I didn't know what it was two years ago. So um, so I want to briefly review some of these definitions here and then talk about the ideas for proving this theorem. Um, so let's see. Right. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so a number field is just a finite extension, of course. A uh, right, a quaternion algebra algebra A over K is a right four-dimensional uh, central simple algebra this is one definition so uh, simple means of course it has no two-sided ideal central means that the center of the algebra is just the K sitting inside the algebra. And it should be four-dimensional. And uh, right, we can always write right, um, A sort of is equal to the set of, uh, let's say, P plus Q I plus R J, sorry, plus S K um, with P Q R S in uh, K. So this here we have one I J. Sorry, let me just stop here. Where what we have is um, we have I squared is some A in K j squared is some b in k. And uh, ij is uh, minus ji, okay, or vice versa. So and then we can write uh, a, well, I've seen two different uh, notations, a comma b over k, or I've also seen a, B, subscript K. Okay, and this is called the Hilbert symbol. So, um, and this is so, some way of generating quaternion algebras. Okay. Um, and there's a couple more things I should say about these, which are kind of germane. Okay. Does everyone know what a place 
for a number of fields is? Uh, do we assume that? Maybe not. <laughs> okay, so yeah, again, two years ago I wasn't completely clear on this. So um, maybe just briefly, a place for k. Well, a bit of a mess, but um, basically is an equivalence class of norms. So we should have norm of A, B is the product of norms. So norm sort of real valued, well, positive real valued, so R plus valued. And norm of A plus B is less than or equal to norm A plus norm B. And there's this sort of non-Archimedean condition, which is norm of A plus B less than max norm A, norm B. So these, of course, A, B are in the field. So the point is that um, non-Archimedean, this is short for. So the point is that uh, if you have an embedding of K into the complex numbers, those are give you the sort of Archimedean places or infinite places uh, just by taking this usual norm on the complex numbers. And otherwise, you get these norms coming from ideals in K. You sort of, um, right, if K is, right, if something is a ratio, if you have sort of P and Q in P over Q in K, which is the field of fractions, right, for, uh, so P q and the integers for k, then you could see kind of uh, in what powers of the prime ideal, I th if you have a given prime ideal here, then uh, let's make this a little fancier, then you could see in what powers of that prime ideal p and q are, and that gives you a um, evaluation here, and then you take some, like say, just e to that or some power to that. Uh, and that gives you a norm. Okay, So uh, if you do that with the standard rational numbers, then these non-Archimedean guys will give you the p-adic valuations for the primes. And so it's just you're embedding the rational numbers into the, the p-adics. Okay? And the proof of this is just going to use kind of all this machinery in a way that I'm going to try to encapsulate in the first 15 or 20 minutes. Um, in a sense, it, we're just going to take the standard machinery of number theory and then turn this theorem into a problem in geometry. And we're just going to solve this problem in geometry because I'm a geometer. I'm not a number theorist. Uh, it's an excellent question, <laughs> right? And I've been thinking about that. I was up late last night thinking about exactly <laughs> that question. and. Uh, I'm reasonably sure that this theorem does not appear anywhere. And th there's another way of asking this question of can you do it directly, right? And to do it would mean you sort of construct a surface by hand that just, sorry, or uh, folks in. So yeah, but it, it seems like if you were. There's a question of the difficulty of this theorem. <laughs> and I, I'm actually quite interested in the, the difficulty of this theorem. But let's, let's come back to it toward the end of, of the lecture. I, I suspect that it's more difficult than people expect. But we'll come back to it. Um, OK, so where are we? Right. So the point is that there are the kind of, so there are real places which come from embedding k into the real numbers. Uh, there are the complex places, which come from embedding k into complex numbers that are not embeddings into the real numbers. And then there are these kind of non-Archimedean places, 
or finite places that are kind of embedding k into, I'll just say, into periodic numbers. And there isn't that much more than we want to say about this. And uh, right, oh, but there's, what I want to say is there's uh, one more thing. Maybe I'll just fit it in here. So there are two division, al so there are two quaternion algebras over R. Right, there's the two by two real matrices, that's always a quaternion algebra over the field. And there's also the Hamiltonians, right, which are this P plus QI. Well, I could just write it now that we have our Hilbert symbol. It's just minus one, comma minus one over R, right? That's the original quaternions of Hamilton. Here, there's only one quaternion algebra. The only thing that there is over C is, um, is the two by two matrices. And here, I'm told, I have no idea how to prove this, that there are two. There's M2 of K and something else, some division algebra. OK, so, um, so the point is that there are just two. And then there's a theorem. Maybe, I guess I'll try to write the theorem on the board in this sort of narrow space. So the, the point is that if you take any place like this, you can then kind of tensor. Right? You can take, um, so right, you can take k if we have this embedding of k into this local field, which I'll just write as kind of f, coming from one of these places. So these p-adic numbers, they're, the f is either like reals or complexes or p-adics. Then we can take uh, a tensored over um, with this field. And we say this, right, a, so if this is, this could be M2 of the field. And then we say that A splits. Or just to make it slightly more confusing, A is unramified. And the other possibility is that this is a division algebra. And then we say that A is ramified. So I should say A splits, A is unramified. This is all over F, or the associated place. Okay, Really, over the associated place, but whatever. Um, so do we want to keep the theorem? Maybe we don't want to keep the theorem. So again, this is either. Very old to you or very new, or possibly in between. And where do we go with this? Yes. So again, another theorem I do not know how to prove. Well, there's two parts. So first is uh, any quaternion algebra A over k is ramified over a finite uh, set of places of even cardinality. So if you take all the places ramified, There are finitely many places, and this number of places where it's ramified is even. And I should say, by the way, right, the embedding into the complex, if you also have its complex conjugation, but they're the same place, because they give you the same absolute value. Uh, but those will never be ramified, anyway. And second, there's a converse to this statement. So for any 
finite set S, well, set S with the size of S even, sorry, finite set S of places. Ah, OK. Sounds good. OK, for any finite set S of places. Uh, one way of saying that I think you might want to have a thought is that it's a regular school in the first case. Yes. 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 But, and you're saying that whether that, that there's some sort of, because of quadratic reciprocity, it no, follows. I see that there's always an even number of pl okay, and then similarly, this is sort of basically following from Minkowski's theorem um, on realization of quadratic forms, uh, but okay. So for any finite set of places with the number even, there exists a unique quaternion algebra, a ramified. At over, over S, let's just say. So ramified at exactly those places. So that provides a kind of classification of quaternion algebras. OK, so that completes. There's a lot of backgrounds here. Um, so that completes all of the literal backgrounds on quaternion algebras. Right, and now we want to briefly define the trace field Nice sound. Now we want to briefly define the trace field and quaternion algebra for a Fuchsian group. And then there's one more thing by way of background, and then we can finally get to the geometry. So let's see, right. So now if a gamma subset of SL2 R, um, so let gamma, ha sorry. Well, OK, if gamma is a subset of SL2R, um, maybe we can just do it that way. OK, so if gamma is a subset of SL2R, right, we have Q trace of gamma is just the field. It's, it's literally just this, right? It's um, the field generated. by the set of trace gamma, gamma in gamma. And we can let the quaternion algebra be 0 of gamma. So that's um, the algebra generated by this over gamma, if this makes any sense. So it's uh, the set of linear combinations, sum of sort of A gamma gamma with A gamma in this guy um, with gamma, this doesn't make any sense, right. Sum of this, where gamma is in gamma, and finitely many of these um, so all but finitely many a gamma equal to zero. Okay, so just finite linear combinations of these guys. And this is a subset of, of course, SL2R. You can do this also for SL2C, obviously. Um, and perhaps we should. But for the most part, we're just looking at these real guys. So this gives us the trace field and quaternion algebra for a subgroup of SL2C. Obviously, if this is a. Uh, 
I, I'm going to talk about that in a second. So, but no, no, no. Wait, let's get, well. Okay. So hold on a sec. So, um, right. Let. I'm not sure if this is going to answer your question, but we let gamma two is the set. Uh, sorry, the group subgroup generated by gamma squared for gamma in gamma. Okay, and then we just define this k gamma is the trace field for this gamma 2, the group generated by the squares. And a gamma is just, again, this a0, sorry, a0 for this gamma 2. These are called the invariant trace field and quaternion algebra. So is that what you were asking, Peter, about the, the squares? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead a little bit. Let's go ahead a little bit. Sorry, this is a lot of review here. So this is just statements. Okay, so let's let's continue. Okay, so now we have enough terminology. Well, at this point, sorry, let me go back here. Actually, that was a little too much force. Um, but let me just say that. Recall the theorem is that theorem, well, just brief. OK, that was a mistake. Um, let's just put this up here. The theorem basically was for suitable conditions that we can get all of these equal to a given thing, right? So we have trace of, sorry, this, this trace field is going to equal the invariant trace field is going to equal some given k and uh, that this quaternion algebra will equal the invariant quaternion algebra will equal a. Okay, that's a summary of the theorem. So given the right gamma. Gamma, is, what did you say about gamma? gamma will be now a discrete Fuchsian group. So if there there will exist gamma uh, co-compact Fuchsian. Inside something, right? Well, yet I've yet to get there, yes. So, so far, just to say that there'll exist this guy, this discrete co-compact Fuchsian group, right? Okay. So there exists this discrete co-compact Fuchsian group with the given trace Turing algebra. And again, we need two conditions, which I'm not writing. So one is that we need that the algebra is not the two by two matrices over k. And you'll see why in a second. And the second, like I don't know what happens when the algebra is two by two matrices over k. That's someone else's business for the moment. And, uh, and then what we need, of course, is the algebra when you tensor with the reals over k is equal to two by two matrices, because it has to be in this situation. OK, so now there's this construction. Right, so the construction is uh, so given k and a, 
right, take a maximal order in A. Kind of vaguely aware of what. Uh, okay, so we'll call it lambda or something, because it's kind of like a lattice. Maximal order lambda in A. Okay, and now, uh, right, and then let. Um, so I left out. There's a k-valued norm on A. Right there's if you write this uh, p plus q i plus r j plus uh, s i j, you can negate the last three terms, multiply call that the conjugate, multiply a guy by its conjugate, and you get the norm. Um, so you get this k-valued norm, and you can take so let I don't know lambda star be the um, or actually let's just say For each uh, infinite unramified place okay which we could think of as eta from K into R or C okay for each infinite unramified place, uh, unramified, of course, A being unramified, um, we get, well, we could take the whole algebra and map it into, uh, well, the point is that the whole algebra is isomorphic to SL2R because it's unramified. So we get a map of, well, we get something like some eta hat from gamma. And the point is that the, unit, the norm on, SL, on the matrix algebra, M2, of over anything is given by the 